So what's up guys, this is going to be the official two-year ownership review of the Alfa Romeo Giulia Quadrifoglio. Now, like I said, 2020 has been totally insane. There was a lot of things that I wanted to do to this car in terms of modifications that were not possible due to the global shutdown. So if you guys follow my content, you know I was going to be doing a full exhaust system by Quicksilver. I was going to be doing the gyro disc brake upgrade, you know, with another set of pads and doing all this other stuff. But I was only able to do a certain number of things that I'm going to talk about. But specifically, what I think this video is going to be great is to share with owners around the world is some of the long-term things to consider about owning this particular car as far as wear and tear. I'm gonna show you guys a lot of items that are gonna be wear and tear items that will be a long-term thing to worry about and I'm gonna to explain to you in detail when I pull over in a little while as far as why those issues are something of concern. But like I said, so far, you know, even though we were shut down for so many months, I still was using the car every day, still detailing the car and doing testing of brake pads and other things and trying to get other stuff going, you know, for the channel. But uh, so far, the car is awesome. I still love it. It's one of the best cars I've ever owned in my life. And I think for a daily driver, if you want an ultra high performance sedan that's not mega horsepower, 5,000 pound car, this is the one you're going to want to get. And I say it over and over in all my content. And I'm also going to link my one-year ownership video as well because I really think if any of you guys never saw that video you should go back and watch that video in its entirety it's a 30 minute long video and I go over all the stuff that I did in the first year of ownership and I did a lot of modifications and product testing and development and all of that stuff and I think that's gonna give you a good point as far as where I went with this platform and then moving forward for the next year or so that I own it I'm still deliberating what do I do with it do I modify it to an extreme level? Do I do a wrap, a vinyl wrap, or something to change the color? Or do I sell this car, because I love this car so much, and get another one? I definitely wouldn't get a 2020 model. I don't want anything to do with the year 2020. I don't want any cars from 2020. But possibly a 2021 or even a 2022, I think I would order another one in Alfa Rosa red. I just think I, that's the color that I would do it in this time around. I would do the same spec with the interior, black and red. I would do the Sparco seats. And moving forward, I possibly would do the carbon ceramic brake disc. So that's going to have to be a special order car. And it's definitely something that's on my radar now of things that I'm possibly considering. So we'll see. So we're going to just, uh, I'm just finishing up my drive over here. I got to go see somebody up north. And when I get back, I'll pull over in a local park and I'll get the camera out of the car and I'll show you guys some of the wear and tear, some of the things to consider, some of the little weird. This car exhibited a couple of weird things this year and it happened two times. One time it happened while I was shooting the video for the EBC yellow uh, brake pad video and it was during a massive heat wave we were having in New York and the car did some funky stuff and I still never addressed it fully at the dealership level, uh, but we were able to rectify and clear out the codes and I'll talk to you guys about that as well. And I'm also going to show you guys some of the parts that I changed in the car, some of the parts that failed, the aftermarket stuff that failed. I have them in the trunk of the car as well. And uh, I just want to show you guys everything and give you guys some good insight as far as moving forward. If you guys have this particular car and are concerned about long term or anything else that's going on with it, I think this video would probably help you with that as far as aftermarket suppliers that are selling knockoff parts. That's something I really want to address in this video, especially with the carbon fiber stuff that I have on my car. There was one particular part, the very first item that I bought in this car that failed miserably. Uh, it didn't fail, but it didn't crack or anything. It just turned yellow and green, and I'm gonna pull it out of the trunk of the car, and I'm gonna show you guys in a little while exactly what went wrong with that. So stay tuned. I mean, I'm just gonna enjoy the car. You can see it. I mean, I'm going at a very rapid pace, and this is how I drive this car on a daily basis and I absolutely love it, absolutely love it. This car, I could get in this car and spend two, three, four hours straight, even with my severe back issues, and I never once get out of this car fatigued or in pain. And for me, 
that means that you have the right car. You have the right car, it's got the right chassis, the right suspension, it's got the right ergonomic of the seat. Everything just seems to work outstanding for my particular needs. Now, will it work for everybody out there? Probably not. I mean, you know, cars are subjective like everything else in life. That's why we have choices. So I really enjoy doing these videos because I love connecting with owners around the globe. I have customers that have this car all over the world, all over Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, everywhere. And it's really cool that, you know, they take my advice, they do some of the modifications, then they contact me and say, Phil, the car is transformed significantly. And that's what I tell people. You know, out of the box, the car is great, but, you know, there's a lot of things that I would like to improve on. And of course, the one of them is the suspension was just not tight enough. And then, you know, lowering the car and changing the geometry significantly changed the dynamics of this car, of course, with the custom Auto Fanatic wheel spacers. But uh, the car is absolutely incredible. You can see it the way I'm driving it. it. Sounds good, looks good, it's comfortable, it's been pretty damn reliable. I'll tell you one thing, in the two years of owning this car, it's never once ended up on a tow truck. And I can't say the same about all the AMG Mercedes that I've owned and BMW M cars that I've owned. Those cars got flatbedded a hell of a lot of times for electrical problems. And even though this car did have a couple of little glitches this particular year, I'm gonna go into specific detail as far as what they were. And they're really, it was nothing that actually got me stranded, but I just wanna share it with you because one thing that happened was totally bizarre. And it actually happened in my Stelvio as well, except it was a little different in the Stelvio. There was one little thing that didn't happen while the other thing happened. And I have a video on my phone that I'm gonna piece into this video just so you guys could get an idea as far as what went on, but it was pretty wild. But uh, I mean, we're booking right now. Absolutely booking. We got a nice fall day in New York. It's about 65 degrees, which is great. We've had some bad weather, which is why this video was delayed by a number of weeks. But uh, you know, it's being posted in the month of November and that's kind of what I do with the one year video as well. So we're gonna pull over in a couple of minutes and we're gonna get this, you know, I'm gonna get the camera out of the car. We're gonna talk some more about owning the Alfa Romeo Giulia Quadrifoglio for two years, daily driving it. I'm actually going on my third winter. In a couple of weeks, we're gonna be putting the winter wheel and tire package on the car, and it's gonna be the third winter with this car, which is, I, I just can't believe how fast the time is gone. And you know, usually when you enjoy something and something has a very good positive experience in your life, it goes right by, you know, that's just the way life is. When something's miserable, all you do is go back to the misery and the negativity of, of what that experience was in your life. But when something is so awesome, the time just keeps going and going. You don't even realize it. And now we're, we're almost over two years going into this ownership. And I'll be honest with you, I don't want to get rid of the car. I love this car. And there's no other car in the market today that I feel that could replace this car. I just don't feel it's out, it's out there right now. But we're going to get off right now and uh, I'll catch up with you guys in a little bit. And uh, we'll talk some more about the two-year ownership of the Alpha Julia Quadrifoglio. So hang tight, guys. All right, guys. So we're going to start with the interior of the car just to show you guys how well it's held up, wear and tear. You guys could see passenger seat. Everything looks good. There's no real wear and tear on the leather and Alcantara. That's all the way across the board. There's no issues with carbon fiber cracking or delaminating. But there's one issue before we get over to the driver's seat is the center armrest. And I'll show you. It's because when you sit in this car, basically the way I sit in this car, my elbow is constantly crushing the foam. So right here, you can see it's all flattened out and kind of deformed. So I'm gonna be doing a video on pulling this apart and fixing this soon. So I'm sure this is gonna be a lot of common issues that a lot of you guys are considering, uh, you know, getting fixed at your dealer. But I think I'm gonna probably do this in Alcantara with the double stitching. I haven't decided yet, but this is gonna be on my things to do list as far as fixing the center armrest lid and putting a little bit more of a denser padding so it eliminates that little bump that you get because it just doesn't look good. But other than that, it's not really worn out. The leather's not stretched too bad, but it's definitely an easy fix for someone that knows how to do upholstery. So usually on any kind of Recaro or Sparco or any kind of high performance seat, these bolsters get destroyed from getting in and out of the car with jeans and a belt. Now, if you look at the car, these bolsters are pretty damn good and I'm zooming in, I'm getting close. There's no de deterioration, there's no cracks, there's nothing. And, I, and the only thing I've done on this car I usually wipe the interior down with a damp microfiber towel and I do use some professional leather conditioner. I only did it like twice since I've owned the car, so I don't really go crazy on it. So you can just see here the interior, everything looks like brand new still. This is after two years of getting, I get in and out of this car probably about 30, 40 times a day. I'm in and out all day long and everything is held up beautifully. Now, a little bit of wear you're gonna see 
is down on the bottom bolster. You see a lot of that cracking, and a lot of that is probably from also getting in and out of the car. Now, over time, because this is a very thin leather, and the Ferrari Maseratis, all these cars that have that Napa-style leather, they just don't really last long as far as long term. So I think in 20, 30 years, this leather is going to be totally shot, but I actually think it's going to be shot probably sooner. So considering this is perfect, and this isn't, this is just something that I'm going to have to keep an eye on, and I'll probably have to pay a little bit more attention as far as conditioning and wear and tear on this section here. So I just wanted to show you guys and give you guys a little bit of an update as far as wear and tear on the car. Now, everything else is great. So I did a video on the custom Alcantara steering wheel. This is one of the best things that I've ever done on this car because as I said in the video when I showed you guys this, I don't like all the seams with the carbon and it just, I don't like the way it feels. A, a, a high performance car should have a uniform steering wheel, uniform texture and feel. It shouldn't have carbon fiber, plastic, leather, Alcantara, just too much going on. So if you watch that video and I'll link it below, all the stuff that I've done in 2020, I modified it. I also added a little bit more padding and it's all stitched in Alcantara. So you can see there. So this thing was awesome. The only thing that I wasn't crazy about was the Koshi overlay just because I don't like the way it fits on the very corners over here, okay? Just for a tolerance thickness. Now, if I was to do this again, I actually made another one of these wheels for a customer in Geneva, Switzerland, and uh, he did not do the carbon fiber. But if I was to do it again, I would have to body work and fill out this area better so this carbon fiber could have a little bit more of a sunken in appearance. But other than that, everything else is great. There's no shrinkage of the leather. That's also very common on Italian cars the leather starts to pull in the very corners of the dash. That's for a lot of people that are in Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, and Florida. If you park the car at a country club or you leave it in a lot all day long with direct sun beating on it, that is very, very common for the glue and the leather to curl up and shrink, and that becomes an actual issue. Now, something that I want to talk about that nobody's going to be talking about this is because this is primarily in the Maserati and Ferrari market. Now, all the plastic, all this plastic has a black soft touch all the buttons, the AC controls, everything on this car is identical the way it's manufactured to a Ferrari and Maserati. Now, you guys could do your research, and I'm just in the process of doing uh, some work on the Ferrari 355. Over time, this soft touch material will deteriorate and get sticky. The black comes off of your hands, and if you touch the red or you touch the light leather, you absolutely ruin it. So these parts have to be sent out, and the best guy in the United States is called Sticky RX. I'll put a link below if you guys want to check out his videos. He shows how he laser etches all the emblems and all the logos back in the position, and he has the best process, and he's the best guy in the United States that does all the refinishing. So over time, and I'm saying maybe another five years, another seven years, maybe 10 years, this would start to deteriorate. And the reason I'm going to tell you that is because, you know, Dave at Sticky RX has told me, He's fixing Ferraris that are three, four years old. So depending on the climatic conditions and how you take care of the car, this is something that I want to explain to you guys for long-term ownership. If you guys plan on buying one of these cars or any car, Ferrari, Maserati, Alfa Romeo, anything that has this soft touch finish, if you plan on keeping it for 10 plus years, just be forewarned, you are going to have to send this out eventually to replace it. Now, also, a lot of guys say, well, what about if I just bought brand new OEM parts and just swapped them out? Well, believe it or not, in the Ferrari market, you could buy brand new parts out of the box, and out of the box, they become sticky. I don't know why. It's just the process that they're using, and you would think that after all these years, they've been doing it since, like, you know, the early 90s, they just can't get on the bandwagon and getting a better process or doing something different. But it's part of their system. It's just something you got to deal with, and I just wanted to let you guys know that over time, this is going to be a failure spot. Now, as far as the carbon fiber, everything else, this is held up well. There's no discoloration. There's no issues from the UV that I've noticed. Everything in the interior of the car has stayed exceptional, except there's one part that failed in this car, and I'm going to show you guys in a minute. Let me go grab it out of the trunk. All right, guys, we're back. So I'm, I've got the camera in the light, and this is the front grill overlay, one of the very first videos that I did on the Alfa Romeo platform. So I'm just, I'm just showing you what happened so if you look at the weave it's got a green yellowish tint to it okay you see that right there in the camera so this piece failed now that's either the clear coat or it's the type of resin that was used to make the carbon fiber overlay so if you look here i was able to get this off safely even though i did a pretty extensive video on how i prepped it but it still bothers me that i spent a lot of money on this and you can see here it just pops right over 
But if you look carefully in the camera, because I'm using new audio and video equipment for this video uh, versus last year, you could see the difference in the color tone from here to here. And it actually got to the point that it started driving me crazy and I just ripped it off the car. Now, one thing I'm gonna tell you, this is what I was mentioning in the intro of the video about knockoff parts. This part is most likely made in China and it was knocked off and sold to me as being a Koshi part, which is coming out of Europe. Now, I got this from Madness Auto Works. This was about two years ago and I paid a couple of hundred bucks for this and it already failed after about a year and a half, probably a little bit sooner than that. So I ripped it off the car, I went back to them, I went back to Koshi, I sent an email, they said that this is a knockoff part, this is not their part. Now if you go on the Madness site, they're listing it as Veloci. I have no idea where they're getting their parts from, so I'm gonna to suggest to anybody out there, do not buy the cheap versions of these if you wanna do it. Do not buy these on eBay coming from China and watch who you're buying these from. If you guys are going to do the carbon fiber kit, I suggest just go get the Mopar Alfa Romeo OEM parts. They're $4.99. You get the top and the bottom. It's a full replacement grill. It's not an overlay, and that's most likely what I'm going to be doing on this car soon. But I'm just kind of upset that I spent $300 on this, and it totally failed, and I just wanted to point this out in the video. Everything else in the car, the mirror overlays, the mirror caps, everything else is held up phenomenal. There's no issues with UV or discoloration on those. Those I know came from Koshi direct and you can see here everything looks like brand new so those have been on the car for about two years as well so the only part that failed is the carbon fiber grill so i'm just going to show you guys a couple of other things as well we're going to walk around the car if you look at the paint it still looks phenomenal the car looks better than it did when i took delivery of it now as far as stone chips before i made the splash guards and designed these i did get a stone chip here i did get one back there and i also got one on the back door now the weird thing is this year i ended up getting a stone chip right here i have no idea how this happened or what would have bounced off the highway i'm trying to get in on it if you could see that there right there you see that little dot so that's a little bit of a rock chip that i got on the car and you know it doesn't really bother me that much but i just wanted to show you guys and you can see the exterior of the car looks absolutely incredible uh as far as the wheels that's going to be something that i'm definitely going to maybe complain a little bit about but when these wheels had the original gunmetal gray finish I just got annoyed that I saw rock chips inside all the spokes. Then I said, you know what, let's just maybe redo this and have them done in satin black. And I really like the way they look. They look really good. But if you see the way by design, the way these spokes curve out, okay, I don't know what's going on, but this is now the second time. These wheels were refinished last year, and there's all micro stone chips. You can see that there. I'm just rubbing it with my finger all through the spokes. So. This car doesn't even have the courses on it. I got the Pilot Super Sports. So something is going on with the design of these wheels that the rocks are getting thrown into here and being pelted all along the spokes as I drive. It's driving me nuts. So what happens is when the spokes get all those chips, and we're talking thousands of chips everywhere, it makes the wheels harder to clean. Now, the reason I say it's definitely by the wheel design and it's not by the car itself is because I have the set of five hole wheels, the original style Alfa Romeo wheels that I use now we're going on the third winter soon and I drove that car with rock salt on the ground sand you name it and the face of the rims are perfect there's no issues on the spokes there's no issues in the barrel it's only the Alfa Romeo forged lightweight technical wheels that I've noticed this not only on my car but on a couple of customers cars that came up to the shop in the last year as well there's stone chips all on the spokes and it just drives me nuts so it's one of those things i want to do a different set of wheels in this car but we're going into winter right now so i'm not really sure what i want to do uh, as far as ordering up also i did the full tarox brake upgrade watch the video on that i no longer have it on the car now the reason i took the tarox brakes off the car is because jerry did it on his car as well and i was going to do the gyro disc upgrade and we were going to do comparative testing between the two cars with two different setups and i wanted to do a comprehensive video and show you guys that what ended up happening is the world got completely shut down gyro disc couldn't supply parts so what ended up happening we we're in a pinch we ended up getting two sets of tarox setups now it didn't make sense for my car and jerry's car to have the same setup because that's not really what do we want to do a video and some content on so i'm going to be doing a video specifically on the full tarax upgrade soon maybe in the next couple of weeks on jerry's car we're going to talk about it they've been on the car for well over nine months already and i'm going to go a little bit about that and go into more detail now i want to do the gyro disc slotted two-piece rotors on this car the situation is i've been trying to get them before the shutdown and even after the shutdown since they started reopening and the back rotors have been out of stock for month after month so i don't want to just do the fronts 
I want to do the fronts and I want to do the rears and I'm probably going to do the EBC yellow, uh, yellow stuff pads as well. I actually like the yellow stuff pads. They're cheap. They're affordable. The dust out is probably like OEM, but they're easier to clean. And I think they're like, if you watch my video, 230 something bucks, you get the front pads and the rear pads and they have the built-in sensors already. So if you guys are concerned about disabling the sensors, look into the EBC uh, brake pads and also the EBC yellow stuff. And I'll link that video as well in the end screen annotations and also in the video description so you guys can go check that out i think they work great now something i want to talk about which is really weird we'll go back into the car now the biggest complaint that a lot of people have in this car is the intelligent braking system they call it the ibs right it drives you nuts so the one thing that i noticed and i want to hear from you guys around the world depending on the type of shoes that i wear the brake feedback and the braking power feels different it's weird so if you have a tennis sneaker if you have a hiking boot if you have a heavy construction boot if you have an italian loafer or dress shoe or even like a puma like a lightweight puma every single time i go in this car with a different type of shoe the brakes feel different i don't know if it's it's definitely not in my head it's definitely from experience because i've been driving this car for two years and i'm in it all day long and there are times where i switch my attire several times throughout the day so i want to hear from you guys and if you guys have noticed a similar attribute of the braking system like the guys whether you have the carbon ceramics or the steel brakes post it in the comment section below i'm dying to know if anybody out there is going to notice this because i picked up on it and i just wanted to share a little bit about that with you today so other than that i mean the car has been phenomenal there's no issues whatsoever now as i mentioned in the intro of the video there was some weird quirk that happened when I was doing the video of the EBC yellow stuff, it was like a real heat, it was like 98 degrees, high humidity. And while I'm doing the video, I'm beating the car hard. I'm pounding on it, 140 mile an hour stop, stop after stop after stop. You know, the car was just getting tossed around. It was, it was bad. I was driving the car, probably the hardest I've ever driven this car before. And something went funky. So I was about 45 minutes north of where I live, maybe about an hour north. And after I did about seven consecutive hard stops from 80 to about 20 over and over, trying to overheat the pads, the goal was I wanted to overheat the pads to see what they could handle. The car just went into limp mode. Check engine light, the dashboard lit up like a Christmas tree. I sh the car shut down, literally shut down. I, pull, I literally rolled over to the side of the road. I get out of the car. I'm looking under the car, see if there's any damage, no smoke, nothing. Pop the hood. The engine was boiling. I finally start the car up. It started stumbling, stumbling. It was, it was vibrating really bad. The engine was shaking and every, there was some noises that I was hearing under the hood. I was getting very concerned. Now, I let the car cool off for about 35 minutes. I get back into the car, same situation. I start it up, the check engine lights on, the car's stumbling. I'm still in limp mode. I can't even get above like 35 miles an hour. So I do a battery disconnect. I go in the trunk, I disconnect the battery, hoping that that would reset something, no. I'm all the way up north, no cell phone service where I was in the middle of the woods. The car is broke down. I'm like freaking out. Like, what am I going to do now? <laughs> the, the country is shut down. I can't call roadside assistance. I'm like, who am I going to call? So I'm going through my phone, go, all my friends that are flatbed drivers, and I'm like calling them or texting them. I'm like, hey, are you around? I may need you to come pick my car up. And they're like, where are you? I'm like, oh, I'm about an hour north. They're like, oh, we're not coming up there. We're not coming up there. So I waited a little bit longer on the side of the road. I started it up, and I said, you know what? I'm just going to chance it. I took another parkway down. I went really slow. I did not push the car. I left it in drive, didn't shift it. And I basically limped this car back to my house. Now, the next day I brought it to the shop. We scan it out through the OBD2 port underneath the dash. And there were three specific codes that were stored in the car. There were engine misfires on cylinder three, on cylinder five. There was fuel pressure uh, issues as well, fuel pressure code. And there was a fuel pump code. Now, we were able to, to erase two of those codes. There was one code in the system. It was a fuel pressure sender, uh, sensor that's under the hood for the direct injection of this car. We were not able to clear that out. Now, a couple of my customers, we talk all the time when issues happen, they also had the same issue. The problem was I didn't want to bring my car because I need this car every day to the dealership and then Italy was shut down. You couldn't get parts supplies. So one of my customers had his car in the dealership for weeks. Another one had it in there for two months. I didn't want to deal with that. So we cleared out the codes and so far the car has been good. Nothing else has happened. It hasn't happened again. There's no stumble. The car's got power. It hasn't shut off. I don't know what's going on, but they said, according to the code, when we decipher it, 
there's a sensor under the hood for the fuel pressure rail that needs to be changed. I talked to an Alfa Romeo technician that I know in the Midwest. He said the same thing. It's a common problem. You just might not be able to get the parts right now. So that's on hold. I'm not going to mess with it right now. I just don't want to like cause any problems and you know issues that I don't really need. And that's pretty much where we're at. Okay, so now if you guys go back and you watch my one-year video, I complained about the alarm system and this funky, uh, there's, a, there's a proximity sensor that's built into this overhead map light, which was replaced. Now, my car used to make the alarm trip constantly. I'm talking every time I was parked in my office, everybody in the building's like, Phil, your car's alarm is constantly going off, whether it was raining, whether it was windy, whether it was cold out. It was driving everybody insane, including myself and my neighbor sometimes when the car was outside. Now, back in late January, February of 2020, I go to start the car up in the morning. It was very, very cold. It was like, like a you know, 30, 20 degree day, like really, really cold winter day. The car hesitated to start. It started up, but it just hesitated. It, it just took a little longer. It was like, you know, it just wouldn't want to get started. So Jerry and I were hanging out. We were over at Harbor Freight. We were doing a bunch of things up in the area. And I was like, you know what? The Alfa Romeo dealer is right down the road. Why don't we just stop by? It was Saturday. And let me see if these guys could scan the car or do something to it. So luckily the technician was working on a saturday we brought the car there he scanned it out it showed low battery voltage they replaced the battery finally and i mentioned this in my one year review video that the battery voltage was an issue and i just never went back to the dealer just because i'm i'm so busy and i don't really want to deal with the dealership of dropping it off and the loaner car and all that and you know i, I just rather not deal with it so we happened to just be there conveniently it worked out they replaced the battery and ever since that battery's been replaced not not only has the alarm not gone off like that, maybe three to four times since January of 2020 till now November of 2020, this alarm has bugged out. And it's only in extreme conditions. Now, I also looked at my security cameras at home that a couple of times deers, some really big deers, were grazing up against the front bumper and the back bumper in the car, which most likely could have tripped the alarm system and the proximity system. So if anybody's having that issue with the alarm, I suggest you possibly go get a new battery installed at your dealer. If they don't do it for you, and if you want to do it yourself, you can look up the battery group code and just get an interstate battery and put it in yourself. It'll take you about an hour. It's a little bit tight back there, but you could do it. But I think the batteries on all Italian cars and even a lot of German cars, if there's a voltage issue, you're going to have problems. Now, something really weird. This is the weirdest thing that ever happened to me in any car in my life. And I've had some situations on BMWs and AMGs where I'd be driving on the highway at about 90 miles an hour and the car would just shut off. It would just literally shut off. I had belts fly off the engine on the Infiniti. I've had everything you could imagine in panic situations where the car shuts off and I got to get over the side of the road without getting killed. Now, a while ago, this happened probably over the summer, probably around uh, July or August. I get into the Julia Quadrifoglio. I start it up. When I start it up, I'm in the car and I can't get out of the car. So I never see, see these buttons here? These light up red when you lock the door. I never touch that, okay? I never touch any settings on the car. So I get into the car, I start it up, these things automatically locked. And then when I go to the button, see, now they work. The buttons were dead. I couldn't unlock or lock the car. I shut the car off, it still was locked. I was locked into my own car, it was the weirdest thing ever. I said, screw it, you know what, let me just go about my day. If I have to, I'll just roll the window down and get myself out of the car. And I've done that before in other cars. So the weirdest thing, I don't know, and if anybody else out there in the world has experienced this, please tell me. I'm driving locally in town. The car's locked, I'm locked into my own car. And every little time I turn the steering wheel more than 20% to the left or 20% to the right, the horn was chirping, but it was chirping very, very low. Almost like if you guys ever heard of a car alarm, like an aftermarket car alarm where the battery in the car was going dead and it's got, it's got a really, really low chirp. It was the weirdest thing ever. I'm locked into my car. The horn was chirping every little time I made an input. I parked the car at my office. I go get lunch. I come back, start it up, and it was gone. It never happened again. But I want to show you guys quick. I, the same situation happened in the Stelvio, but the horn was not chirping. So I'm going to post in the video now a little clip that I took when I had the phone when I was out shopping. And it totally just bugged me out how the car just locked me into the car and it was totally went bonkers. You, you reset it and everything was back to normal. So let me just check that video out right now. Just going to post it in the video. King Alf is possessed. Now I'm in the Stelvio and it just locked the doors and I can't unlock the car. Look at this. It's unbelievable. The car's running. And I shut the car off, same thing, I can't unlock and lock the doors.
All right, guys, so that's it. That is the, uh, the full two-year ownership review video from Auto Fanatic and the Alfa Romeo Giulia Quadrifoglio. And like I said, the car has been fairly bulletproof. I have not had the car into the dealer for any warranty work in the last two years. I have not had the car flatbedded or towed, and I did not get stranded except that one time over the summer when I was doing the brake video of the EBC Yellow stuff and I beat on the car and something just went funky. I still want to get the car into the dealership one of these days to possibly put that fuel pressure rail sensor, replace that and clear out that hard code that's still in the system. It still bothers me, but the car has been running and driving fine. There's no issues whatsoever. I've not gotten stuck. And if I do get stuck, I will report back to you guys in an updated video and I'll probably highlight the whole experience of getting the car towed. But you know, a lot of people can, you know, mention these uh, things. Oh, these cars are so unreliable. They break down. No, they really don't. This car has been one of the best cars that I've ever had in my life as far as reliability, performance, and absolute value. It's value too. You guys could pick these things up used for like under 50 grand right now. I mean, this is a miniature four-door Ferrari. That's really what it is. I mentioned it in my very first video when I took delivery of the car on the engineering and the performance and the way this car feels. It is a little four-door Ferrari, and I absolutely love this car. Do I want to replace it? If I replace it, it's going to have to be with another one. I honestly wish Alfa Romeo had a, had a coupe because I think that would be what, what really what I go for. The 4C is definitely not a car for me. Uh, that car is just a little bit too small. A good friend of mine has one, and it's just not a car that I think I, you know, would get a lot of enjoyment out as far as where I live demographically uh, is the 4C. But to be honest with you, this car is awesome. I'm also going to be replacing this carbon fiber grill situation. I just wanted to show you guys and give you guys a heads up as far as if you guys buy carbon parts, stay away from the crap that's on eBay, and be careful with these aftermarket suppliers. Try to go directly to the source or try to go OEM. That's really the only way I'm going to suggest right now. I'm not going to suggest anybody to go and buy anything aftermarket unless you know the vendor's reputable and they're going to give you a warranty or stick by your product. So when I called for that thing, they said, oh, there's no warranty. It's been past 90 days or whatever. I don't know. But uh, that's pretty much it. So only thing I can tell you is wear and tear has been phenomenal. You, know, you can see the paint. It looks great. There's no issues with that. You know, a couple of stone chips here and there. Now, if I could do it all over again, I probably would do paint protection film. I know my buddy Jerry's got it. He has the whole, the whole nose, the fenders, everything's done. If I could do it all over again, to be honest with you, if I get another one, I'm going to do the whole car. I'm going to do the doors. I'm going to do the quarter panels. I'm going to do everything. Just because where I live and all the construction, there's just rocks being pelted at this thing all day long. And you just, like I said, I got a stone chip in the back of my quarter panel, which was totally, totally odd. And I can't believe that I even got that. But other than that, the car still looks good, performs good. And I love it. There's nothing more I could say. And you guys could hear it in my enthusiasm when I shoot the content on this car. This is one of my favorite cars as well. And a lot of guys have been asking me because a lot of guys also have the GT350s and 350Rs. Hey, which car do you like better? They're so different. They're both phenomenal. And honestly, truly blessed that I'm able to have both of these cars in my possession to share the ownership and all the experiences with you guys around the world. Because, you know, like I said, there's no perfect car out there. But I'm going to tell you now, if you're looking for one of the best, most practical, high performance daily drivers, you know, for you and your family and just to have an awesome car to get into. It just does everything well. This is the car. Now, something else I forgot to touch upon, I'm going to get the piece out of the car right now, is there's a modification that I did to my car recently and I'm going to show you the part right now. Now, you guys know I lower the car. I did a video on that. Now, when you lower this particular car, there's no adjustment of camber. When you actually pull up the specs in a Hunter alignment rack, it shows that there's a, an, an eccentric bolt to adjust camber. But on these cars, there is no adjustment. There's also no camber adjustment in the front. So in order to get camber in the front, you've got to shim it with the control arm and the subframe. It's an absolute pain in the ass, and a lot of alignment shops are not going to do that for you. That is 100% specialty. You've got to go to somebody who knows what they're doing. Now, in the back of the car, when I lowered this car, you know, the negative camber was about two and a half degrees. Two and a half degrees on a lightweight car with independent suspension with a lot of power makes this car extremely nervous and unsettling. I actually lost confidence in this car so many times. I flew off the road so many times in the snow. This car is an absolute handful. It's a lot of fun, but Ferraris are the same way. So the issue was, and I know the issue was too much negative camber. So I recently replaced the upper control arms. You can see that here. This is the cast aluminum piece and it has a rubber bushing in there. So the ones that I replaced them with have an adjustment arm where it replaces the bushing with a spherical rod end so there's no deflection there and it has an adjustment here so we got the camber down to i think negative 1.6 or 1.7 i'm going to tell you now ever since i adjusted the camera on the car the car launches safer the car grips better and the rear suspension articulation the way the car dials into a corner is phenomenal now the car's confidence for me as the driver has gone up 
well over 50% ever since I replaced these arms. And I'm gonna suggest that as well. So if you guys want, do your research. And if you can find a vendor that is making these in Europe or anywhere in the world, go out there and buy them if your car is lowered. If your car is not lowered, I don't think you're really gonna notice much of a difference. But if your car is lowered, I cannot suggest doing this. It, it, the, this the improvement that it's made is just phenomenal. The suspension, the ride quality, everything is, seems to have gotten better now that the back suspension is communicating 100% better than it ever did. When the car was lowered for the first year of ownership, I was just very unsettled with it. There was a lot of times where I lost control with the car. I flew right off the road and I just always had a hard time launching this car where it would lose traction and it would just fly all over the road and it, may, it becomes a little bit dangerous. That's why I never tuned it. The reason I never tuned it is because I didn't have the confidence in the grip and the stability of the rear end of this car being lowered with too much camber. Too much camber, believe it or not, on a daily driven car, some of you driving on the street, is actually gonna cause negative effects and that's what I've noticed firsthand. And by fixing the negative camber, it totally restored my confidence back into this car that I'm pushing it harder, I'm going harder into corners, I'm doing things with the car that I would do with other cars because I had more confidence. Now, it's unbelievable. Now I actually want to put the corset tires, I want to get another set of corset tires and put them back on the car. But uh, we'll see what we're going to do. I also was planning on doing a full exhaust system, but you know, after testing a lot of this stuff, you know, a lot of my customer uh, down in Florida now, he's got the full Acropovic system. <laughs> It's expensive, but when you put them side by side between all the systems that I've tested and heard, I don't know if it's really worth it because the twin turbo in this engine is going to negate the type of NA sound that I'm looking for of a Ferrari. You know, that's just what it is. I like that 9,000 RPM whale and that high pitched scream. And like I said, the car sounds so damn good with the centerline Alpha X pipe. I'm happy with it. I'm content with it. I don't really think I'm going to mess with the exhaust anymore because I think I'm just going to be going down an expensive rabbit hole and I'm never going to get this car to sound the way it is. I also have the 355. I want to open it up and get that NA sound. I got the 355 that I could take out whenever I want. Uh, that'll give me my you know bells and whistles as far as what I want and I also have the three G Shelby GT 350R so I'm not really uh, you know hurting for a loud exhaust I have cars that you know have that exhaust sound and they do have that exhilaration as far as when I open them up that I could get from elsewhere but just something I want to tell you guys about now as far as what I want to do to this car in the future I think I want to do a set of one-piece wheels possibly a carbon fiber barrel rim from Forge Line. if you guys go on the Forge Line website I'll put a couple of photos up here these are the, these these wheels are like super high end but they have the carbon fiber barrel so you're going to reduce that unsprung weight and it's also going to absorb a lot of the nvh of the crappy roads that i live on are they going to be safe to do i don't know is it worth 12 grand i don't really know but if i do consider getting another one i may do a set of those wheels soon and then i will transfer those also to the new car as well not really sure i may do some more interior upgrades as far as the Alcantara on the bottom of the doors and also the B pillars. I think I'm going to do that soon, possibly over the winter, because I just got a shipment of Alcantara in from Italy. And I'm also going to do a couple of other things as well. So like I said, thanks for watching this video. Thanks for your support around the world. Also, head over to the AutoFanatic website today and support AutoFanatic and all the products and services that I offer as a brand. And like I said, stay tuned for more Alfa Romeo content. Please like, subscribe, and share. And also, all the owners around the world, I want to hear your feedback. I want to hear your ownership, any quirks, anything weird has happened to your car post it in the comment section below or you could also always contact me direct through the auto fanatic website and we'll talk some more about it and i love connecting and sharing all this stuff with you guys around the world other fellow enthusiasts and other owners around the world and that's pretty much how we built up the content and the community for the alfa romeo brand all over the internet and social media so stay tuned i'm getting back in i'm going to enjoy the car for the rest of the day and i'll see you guys in the next video real soon take care guys